Well, thank you. Thank you all for uh, doing this, getting insights into young people and their investigations and their starts and their careers and their beginning of the careers is always um, a window into what the uh, future can bring. Um, I think what you saw here were five different individuals at five different levels of their um, uh, pathway in medical mycology. Um, I think it's a wide spectrum with all kinds of different issues and challenges and opportunities. What I'd like to do now, and we're not too bad on time, um, is to, I have a panel here, facilitated discussion, people. This hasn't been um, vetted and it hasn't been practiced, uh, but uh, they've been sitting here listening to these young people. I, I, I think I will start with them first. Uh, um, with, um, with each one down here that we have. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll start with, um, uh, I think I'll start with Floyd. And Floyd, um, you have five different people here. Uh, is there anything you want to talk to them about, uh, discuss with them, any issues that you see, uh, you've listened to them, and uh, uh, kind of giving feedback? And if you want to start from right to left, uh, I'd, that'd be fine. You see, John's still picking on his postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I know you can take it. <laughs> and so one, and so one thing that impressed me. You talk about your um, trajectory through some of you from, from undergrad experiences in a research lab, moving through, and how. And so one of the questions that I have, and anybody can answer, is if you were to design a program. Um, for getting people into medical mycology and supporting them all the way from undergraduate through um, PhD grad or going through for the clinical route, what would that kind of, what would that program look like? That that includes funding, yes. <laughs> I would say um, maybe introducing the students, even undergrad students, to more microbiology, mycology classes, even labs, even coming and shadowing us when we round in the hospital. Uh, I do have some students that come and shadow me in the clinic, and I think that's a great exposure to them to see actually what we deal with day to day, what are the patient's problem we deal with, not only in mycology, I do valley fever clinic, but in general, infectious diseases clinic. That actually brings a lot of interest to the point that the students at the end, they say, can I come back, even at the undergrad level. So I think um, just introducing the concept of um, infectious disease, microbiology, mycology, and all the studies that come with it is very important, very early on. The other thing that I was actually discussing this yesterday is we, at the University of Arizona, now we have a path for medical students when they come in, if they know they really want to do uh, primary care uh, specialties, they, um, they go to that path and that way they will stay in the state of Arizona for underserved areas. Why not having same path for say infectious disease fellowship and that would help us recruiting all those people who are interested alleviating the, the difficulty of recruiting people, and then those people who come stay with us, you know. I would also like to, as somebody who has actually um, undergone a um, research-based training program in parallel to, to medical school, I would like to highlight the transferable skills that are not dedicated to one area, to medical mycology, to infectious diseases, but that circulate around navigating the research environment, uh, scientific publications, a good foundation in statistics and methodology, and uh, in particular grantsmanship and uh, developing those um, grant strategies um, early on. That's, um, that's I think, a, a critical point. And so, because one thing that I've noticed throughout the years is that there are some training programs which actually take, which actually are meant to take you from undergrad to um, into a research program. But most of the, a lot of those um, training programs, they count as a success. You go into a PhD program, and not a success if you go to medical school. Mm -hmm. 
And so a lot of the people who interview for those sort of programs, they ask you, do you want to go to grad school? Do you want to go to medical school? And if you say medical school, they kind of put you over here because that's a sign of not success. And a lot of people have been fighting back on that because, as we all know, a lot of medical doctors do go on and do research and things such as that. And so at least from my mind, I think maybe we need to consider it a success if they go into any sort of research um, mm -hmm. career path, medical school or, or going to get a, a PhD. But the other piece that I think that is helpful, because some of you are stuck at that, I'm trying to get to the next stage of my career, but the piece that I'm missing is the funding piece. Yes. And so if you all believe that, you know, medical mycology is underserved and it should be served more, do you think maybe something that addresses that piece to kind of get you from that 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 postdoc or or junior level clinician and to um, um, grant to get you to that next step in your career be worthwhile? Um, absolutely. <laughs> I think that a lot of um, the funding, it, it's a lot of the microbiology funding, none of it is, I, I have found that none of it is like specific for mycology, um, especially for early career investigators. And I think there's not a lot of mycology research, so we kind of get like overlooked, especially like on study sections and stuff like that. Am I okay? Still picking on me? I'm sorry. <laughs> am, am I okay? You're okay. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to Carol. <laughs> I was just going to say one thing to answer your question is I think that small pilot grants, even if it's not, you know, even a couple hundred dollars from a medical student is very encouraging. Um, and it's positive feedback and can go a long way. And there's, I think there's a lot of students who are willing to work for, without pay, you know, medical students. But if you give them that little award, I think it's great positive feedback. Yeah, very encouraging. Um, okay. Well, I have some specific questions for specific people. Before that, just that kind of conversation made me just wonder in, in general uh, to ask you all uh, what's happening in your medical schools in terms of uh, infectious diseases and uh, microbiology training. Uh, at our school at Michigan, uh, they're truncating, you know, it went from five weeks down to three weeks now, uh, and uh, making it much more difficult. We can't do any lab work. Now, that's mm -hmm. because of COVID, but uh, my worry is it's gone forever. Are you all experiencing similar yeah. things, those of you in MD programs? Yeah, at uh, our institution, there has been uh, this shrinking in the curriculum now, so uh, there is no infectious diseases course anymore. Um, so basically now they've done these immer clinical immersions that the med students in the early stages do, so first year and second year. Um, so they get more clinical exposure, but the uh, infectious disease curriculum now is very fragmented. So I think that might be a change that is... Yeah, so I think this may be a universal phenomenon which we need to resist <laughs> as best we can. Um, so, but a couple specific questions. So, um, for, um, uh, oh, Dr. Donovan. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure I said you're right. I didn't write your name yes, down you did. correctly. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, a big question that comes up all the time seems to be, okay, so you have these data now. What do you tell physicians, uh, primary care physicians, uh, when they have a patient uh, who, moves into the area, for example, and uh, has RA and is on some nasty drugs, uh, can you give them some firm advice from your data? That's a wonderful question. Um, I wish I had the confirmed answer for you, but that's what the reason actually I'm interested in this field um, is that there are, lo there are a lot of people, even in our area, which is most endemic area for valley fever, uh, I'm talking about physicians in the area who are very unfamiliar with the disease. So one of the aspects of our efforts in our area is that, especially beginning of the fiscal year for residents and students, July 1st, we go in different hospitals and different communities. We have a lot of retirement centers. I go to give a talk about the disease. And believe it or not, a lot of our patients actually remind their doctors, so can you please test me for this disease? So I think we have been successful. We are not there yet, but we have been very successful in raising awareness for the disease. Coming to your question about specifically this population, 
I have developed this interaction and communication with the specialty rheumatology, gastroenterology, and dermatology people who are putting these patients on these biologics, which is amazing. They respond very well. Um, if the coccyx serology comes back like positive, now what do we do? And that's, and I think I, I'm a great believer that actually the group of people who have been in the area long enough and developed that immunity, if we can enroll these people in our study, of course, funding comes back. You know, we have to have the funding to do this study, but I think people who do have that gamma interferon, uh, gamma response, um, they come to the category of people who actually can go on those biologics. Having said that, I try to monitor these people more frequently in my clinic. I bring them more often. Um, serology is not the best test, but so far that's the only thing we have until we can develop better tests. And then, having more frequent serologies. I, these patients know my cell number, they call me all the time, and they, if there is any change in their clinical status, they truly call me all at any time in the day or night. So we are communicating with patients and their providers. Can I tell them not to go on their biologics when sometimes I have a young lady who has severe psoriatic arthritis and she says, you know, if I don't take this medication, I'll be on wheelchair. So what do I say to that patient? So for people who have higher risk, we continue with fulconazole as prophylactic measure. However, as you know, fulconazole has a lot of side effects. So there are some times that patients tell me, you know, I really can't tolerate it. Can I please come off of it? And I have had patients who are off of fluconazole on biologics, have lived in Tucson all their lives, and they're fine. So it seems to me the most important thing you're saying is ID is active right up front uh, and follows those patients and sees them in clinic, uh, which is a model I think we would all like to do. Now with histo, that may be a little tougher um, because it's not such a well-defined area. Um, and um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we have a similar case also in patients with histosplasmosis that have some kind of immunocompromise in their own biologics. We have a very close relationship to the rheumatologist or the oncologist if they are on um, some kind of immunotherapy. Um, and it's a, typically a discussion between the patient and the rheumatologist or the oncologist regarding risk and benefits of continuing restarting, continuing the antifungal. So it's really case by case, but we don't have like specific guidance in, in these cases, so it's, it's, it's difficult. I have to add one more point is Dr. Galgiani, who's our director, Valley Fever Center for Excellence. I give all the credit to him. He has done a fantastic job. We have now actually our center, we have Valley Fever Clinic as a subspecialty of our ID clinic. And we are a referral center. A lot of patients are sent to us, and um, a lot of providers know about us, so that actually makes our life much easier. Yes. I don't, I don't want to take more time, except for one quick question. Um, Shannon, why Dublinensis? <laughs> why did you pick that candida? Um, so I skipped over, like, a decade of work that was done in our lab. <laughs> um, but. The whole project started, we were studying, or not me, it was before I got there, they were studying synergistic um, interactions between Canada species and um, Staph aureus, and they found that c -dub didn't have the same synergistic lethality as Canada albicans, and then I think they just decided to try infecting the mice again, and they discovered this, and that's where we are now. <laughs> so just to sort of build on that, um, is the lethal challenge, is that with like a big dose of c -dub, or is that with other organisms? Sorry if that wasn't clear, but the lethal, like we've tried multiple different types of lethal challenge. Um, primarily it's Canada albicans and Staph aureus because that's our, we have a polymicrobial intra-abdominal model. Um, so the lethal challenge isn't with c -dub. Gotcha. So um, I want to start with sort of a general question that's open to all of you and then I have a a couple specific questions for some of you. Um, you've all touched on mentorship as part of what's led you to where you are now. I was wondering if you could sort of help educate us as an audience. What is there a particular feature of that mentorship that 
um, helped engage you in, you know, your your PI, your mentors kind of work? You know, was it what was it that made them a good mentor that has been a pleasure to work with? Mm. I can start. So I think um, if if they have the same interest, it's it's I guess an important point. But it usually doesn't have to be, you know, in clinical area or research area. Um, but I think there has to be a good relationship, and they understand what your goals are, and there has to be, you know, a clear point about what you expect from each other. Um, so as long as that relationship goes well, I think that's going to be very successful. But I think it's also important to be flexible and keep an open mind. Sometimes career plans don't go as you're <laughs> expecting. Um, so, you know, choosing a mentor can, it cannot be the perfect one, so you have to keep your open mind and just um, keep seeking for that um, relationship that you're, it can be important for your career. I think in, in our case, it's, uh, if, if Dr. Contianis, there is a, um, a wonderful synergy um, between me being more, a little bit more on the procedural, statistical assay development and, um, and big data mechanistic um, immunology side and then getting those clinical inspirations. I think that this harmonizes very well. There's a constant uh, back and forth of, of ideas and, and great synergies. Um, this is of course one part and, and the other part is having a, a mentor who is supportive of the particular um, needs of of career promotion for uh, for non-residents, and, and I think having somebody who, who has undergone the, the some, same struggles when he came to the U.S., uh, having limitations in terms of, of grant eligibility and um, and, and promoting um, yeah, directions around these limitations and, and, and helping to um, to to grow in the field. That's, that's very important. Um, So I think um, just a second question specifically for Dr. Donovan and um, Dr. Smith. Both of you touched on disparities um, that exist in the conditions that you're focused on. And I'm, I'm wondering as more funds are made available for kind of correction of health disparities or improvement of health disparities, is that a funding angle that you guys have looked into? We'll try. Uh, actually, that's, as you know, is a challenge for all of us. And um, over the past, uh, I would say, from November of last year, I have applied for four grants, and a couple of them are still in the, under review, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, as you all mentioned, that we all have to hit the wall and pick up ourselves and keep going, so that's my plan. Agreed. Um, I think that there's some steps in between where I'm at with research and, and seeing whether I think social determinants of health play a role in fungal sinusitis, um, whether there's more genetic bias or basis for it. Um, but I think there's a lot to be discovered. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna ask a question for Sebastian because I know what he said. Um, a couple of suggestions or, or uh, questions or whatever. Uh, one suggestion for Stephanie for her sinusitis problem, uh, problem and project. Uh, there is an interesting paper that was published in the Indian Journal of, of Ophthalmology in the middle of uh, COVID associated mucormacosis with ranorbital mucormacosis. And these people are uh, trying to stage the disease. Uh, there have been some Korean studies with MRI as a staging. Uh, modality if you have uh, uh, extension to the eye and the, the degree of surgery. But the stage the disease, stage one, A to D, B, three, and four, A to D, and they found that if the disease anatomically or by surgery is confined to stage three A and earlier, surgery is curative. And it's futile if you have a so I was wondering if you can look in this paper or if you don't have it, email me and I can send this to you. Uh, whether in your prospective evaluation you can validate this type of staging system because the question is I don't think you can build a career on a descriptive cohort. You need to, to, gap the, to, to, to probe the gap of knowledge and that's mm -hmm. one opportunity. The second opportunity is can you incorporate PCR-based diagnosis mm -hmm. 
um, because uh, he, he, the presentation of disease is not specific, as you know. And I'm reflected on our own experience who published, it was not in your, in your references. In hematology patients, we found that it doesn't matter, you know, all of our cases are diagnosed on day one after symptoms with rhinoscopy. And what drives the prognosis is underlying disease. So day to pre from onset of symptoms to diagnosis is another parameter. That, that's the three suggestions. For uh, uh, Fariba, the only thing I was wondering, and we we'll talked a little bit earlier about this, this has been the, the story of my life. The story of my life has been, I have a patient with a bad fungal infection, he's dying of leukemia, I want to give him salvas chemotherapy, can I do it? So we have to make a lot of decisions about when it's safe for bacterial mm -hmm. infections versus fungal infections, and there are some data, old data, from aspergillosis, you need to treat the disease for two, three uh, weeks, and if stability, go ahead, because the person is going to die of leukemia. But for coxia, a good idea is, because TNF is the disruptor for granulomas, maybe an idea is to do a PET-CT to stage the disease if it's negative, right. continue, continue fluconazole, and I'm reminded also, I'm not a coxia expert of the diabetes, being a very important co comorbidity, and maybe you can look whether diabetes alters the natural history of reactivation. But I think in your cohort, I think the, the novelty is, can you prove uh, immunological imprinting? You know, people who have been in the area got exposed versus the, the newcomers. And for Sharon, the, the question I have, if I understood well, you do the intra, intra, uh, intraperitoneal inoculation and then you go to bone marrow, you have expansion of myeloid cells, and this is uh, the inflammatory, and then you don't get candida sepsis. But the question is, intraabdominal candida come from the gut. So this candida is uh, somehow adapted to the gut lifestyle, and then you have a transection of the gut, and then you have invasion of candida through, you know, some kind of injury of the gut. So are you planning to do some kind of uh, experiment, similar experiment, when you feed mice, with, say, Candida dubliniensis, and then challenge them uh, with Candida. And there, have been, there, there was a journal of experimental medicine paper seven years ago, if I remember, when they gave beta D-glucan to mice, and then they challenged them with Candida uh, through perception, and they found that there is an immune tone. Candida says the immune tone in the gut through the beta D-glucan administration. So, if you want to go to real life questions, can, can it be the gut when you're going to do these experiments other than the artificiality of intravenous uh, inoculation and intraperitoneal? I was wondering if. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, it's something that I've thought a lot about because obviously Canada's, most people talk about it in the gut. It's not something that I've actively pursued, but as I am thinking about what I'm going to do in the future, I think that's a really interesting question to address. Um, yeah, Floyd. I just, I just have um, a question regarding, each of you talked about challenges that you have at particular stages in your life that seems that I would think at least oftentimes a significant amount of stress. So I'm just asking, what are those, some of those things that you do to counterbalance, to, to counterbalance that? Because you know they say pressure makes a pipe burst, and we don't want none of y'all to blow up over there. So what are you doing, or what do you think that you could do? What has anybody recommended to you, and maybe you've taken their advice or not, to, um, to kind of deal with that potential stress? Write a grant yeah. <laughs> I, I think oh, no, I, I have I have young kids and it's unavoidable. I mean, yes, I will get stressed about doing things, but when you're with them, I mean, playing Barbie dolls is fun, right? Or going to a softball game, and watching it. So um, it's both a, both a, both a challenge, but also a, a stress relief. Um, I, I was going to say that I think it's helpful to have a very supportive. Um, environment where you work. Um, sometimes that can be very helpful in those cases when you're very stressed and they can help you with advice or opinions to help you with whatever issue you're going through. Um, so I think that might be important. Yeah, I would also like to, to second or split the answer first to, to second and I, I think it's really critical to be in a 
in a friendly and, and supportive environment, and I think we have that to a, a large degree at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And of course, it's also important to have um, avenues outside the scientific world uh, to get some pleasure. In my case, it's traveling. <laughs> You know, one, one thing I always want to remember is family support, that, you know, I have extremely supportive husband, and that's always very helpful to kind of talk about the stressor and get rid of them. Uh, the other thing is I always talk to my mentor, and he's amazing to just, you know, stuff that is out of your control is out of your control. You have to just deal with it. <laughs> And as you, you said, I like writing. Uh, the moment I'm stressed out, some good ideas come up and I write down all of those and start building on that for the next grant or next paper or next experiment. Um, I, would, I didn't answer the question about what makes a good mentor, but I would say that <clears throat> all of my mentors have been very supportive and I've been fortunate that they all have a pretty good work-life balance that I've been able to emulate in my own life and career. And then um, also just my experiences in the different labs I've worked in, the people that I work with, I look up to them a lot because um, a lot of them have gone through the things that I'm about to go through. And so when I get really stressed about a paper I'm writing or whether I should apply for this grant or how I should structure my talk for this conference, I reach out to those people um, and they help me. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, I had a mentor who um, was both a clinician and investigator, and, and she like, kind of keyed me into the secret that actually doing research lends you a little bit of flexibility or a different type of stress, but when you're a clinician, it's kind of nice to balance out. And so for the uh, maybe clinicians who are thinking about research careers, um, it's something to consider. Can I also give a piece of advice, being a little bit senior. I think I got it right where I work, because you need to get to have perspective of what you do and how important or less important it is. Like where I work, my patients die and fight for their lives every week, and if my grant is not approved or my paper is rejected, I take a deep breath and I say, at the end of the day, I don't have. Yeah. End stage pancreatic cancer, which is a, a very sobering uh, coping mechanism, but this is what it is. And, and one of the best advice given to me ever, I was uh, in a heat genetics lab at MIT, working in a high fly lab, and I was the least of the least, you know, the most unaccomplished person in this lab. And all my experience was not working, and I was getting depressed and everything. So somebody comes, a senior, uh, and he said, listen, you know, your experiment is not going to be that you're flying a rocket to the moon, and if the rocket doesn't launch, it's going to, it's an experiment, you know, just take a deep breath, take a perspective, and try again, you know. It's, I think having a perspective and a balanced life is a very good uh, remedy for frustration that, is in everybody's life. It's not only in yours, and everybody has this type of frustrations. It just has perspective of what this is all about. I think I would also add um, pursuing peer mentorship, especially peer mentorship outside your institution. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for being able to discuss a shared experience, you know, and I think um, it's a little bit of human nature to think uh, when you're going through a challenge and something's not working, you know, is, is the grass greener somewhere else? Um, and then you talk to somebody that's somewhere else and they have the exact same set of challenges that you are. Um, and it, it adds to that kind of perspective element, you know. I think um, academics, medicine, research, it's all an evolving field. Um, and what worked 20 years ago doesn't always work now and 10 years ago and doesn't work now. And so how are people in kind of a similar position to you troubleshooting some of the challenges that you might be going through? And I think that can be um, helpful inspiration too. Got David standing here for a long time. So David, it's you. So hi. Um, it was very ref refreshing, Stephanie, to hear you talk about sinusitis, because we don't always hear about that in fungal meetings, and it's really nice. Thank you. I was part of a, the Isham uh, sinusitis working group, and we met in Chandigarh in India in about 2008 and wrote a paper in 2009, and we had several ENT people at that meeting, which was really 
great because you know your observations are you know right there with your uh, endoscopes and you see it all and we sort of think about it in a rather ethereal sort of way. One of the people there was a, a lady who's now died, Berylyn Ferguson, who you probably know the literature of. Um, and we had really interesting conversations on three or four different points, which I thought might be useful because you've got a network and you might be able to answer some of these questions. So when you go in and you find a fungus ball or you find a fungus full of pus, and you're not sure if it's bacterial or fungal, but it looks fungal, one of the questions that was raised was, should you biopsy the mucosa? Because it's not invasive. At least it shouldn't be invasive, right? Well, in maxillary sinus, that's pretty easy. You just clear it out and you create a big antrum and it's not so difficult. But if it's sphenoid, maybe I should check question. And she made the observation that she did biopsies in some of those patients and she lost a couple of them because they either bled or they got direct infection in those phenocytes as a result of the biopsy. So she, from a personal perspective, decided not to biopsy if it was a sphenocytes. Mm. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. But what's the right answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what the right answer is. I don't think she did, but she had a personal experience and she didn't want to do it. So there might be some, that, that was one of the questions. We also were, most of the time, we were talking about allergic fungal sinusitis or acidophilic rhinofungal sinusitis, or whatever you want to, EMS and aspirin-related and all of that stuff that, you know, you, you deal with. And we decided that we had to advise that the mucus needed to go to histopathology to look for fungus. Not the tissue, but the mucus because that's where the fungus was. And actually there's some quite nice science where you can light up the fungus which, for Elton hair or something in all that mucus, sitting in the mucus. Now how many ENT surgeons send mucus to the lab and how many process it? I would think the answer's close to zero, <laughs> right? Yeah. But maybe it would be useful. Um, and I don't know if you want to make some observations on that. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if this community is aware of it or not, but um, in like the early 2000s, um, at kind of the tail end of when I was at medical school at Mayo, Jan Ponikow kind of came up with this idea that all sinusitis was related to fungus because they cultured fungus out of the mucus um, of patients with sinusitis. And so it was a big kind of hype and um, there were some pri proprietary antifungals that were developed um, but then we kind of discovered that you can really culture fungus out of a lot of normal people's mucus. And so fungus was kind of um, dismissed. And it's my feeling and several people in the ENT world feeling that now the pendulum is swinging a little bit kind of in the middle and we think maybe there is a role in the uh, mycobiome or microbiome um, that fungus plays that we don't understand fully. Um, but that's my understanding of in terms of whether or not there's a rule to culture mucus at this point is and maybe, questionable. Maybe culture's the wrong methodology. Maybe we should be PCR. Maybe we should be measuring glucan. Maybe we should be measuring a cytokine or two. Uh, I don't know. But I think you've, you're in a pole position to try and answer some of these questions. If you can figure out a, a nice, clean question to ask to start the ball rolling, which is the other thing. My own personal experience of antifungals for these patients is I only got referred to them as infectious disease physician when they've been through ENT four and five times and they've taken the nasal polyps out and they've done it again and again and again. And then the patient has found to be allergic to fungus or skin test positive or IgE positive and they said, what do you do? And these really refractory cases I would treat with antifungals and they would work, usually at triconazole. And there's some series from India on that. Well, there's a little study to be done, right? Another one. And then we earlier on the, we heard the, a comment which uh, Pete Pappas was very supportive of, I can't remember who made the comment, about genetics. And of course, this is going to be genetically determined in part, mm. isn't it? <laughs> so if you can create a fantastic genetic repository and really phenotype those patients carefully, you'll be in a fantastic position in three years' time with zillion control human genomes out there and starting to look at things. Probably 
not asking a question, I wonder if it's this cytokine or it's going to be that SNP, but rather a whole genome sequencing mm -hmm. and doing proper analysis. So I think you're in a fantastic position. It's just thinking through some really interesting easy wins and some longer term support that, or um, uh, resources that you can develop. And my comments on this are very specific because I've focused on that, but they're relevant to lots of young investigators in different areas when they're doing this. It's, it's a, they're fairly generic, but you, because you've got a network, you've got a, a special source, if you like, working in this area. I think there's an opportunity for you to do really quite a lot, I think. Thank you. I would also like to second this for, uh, as an important comment for all studies on antifungal immunotherapy, obviously, and um, hidden on that long slide of future directions, it, it was on the agenda. I think it would be very critical uh, if you want to better understand which host will benefit the, the most from, from certain immunotherapies to, to incorporate these studies, both in preclinical models and, and also like, think about clinical repositories for, for these uh, type of questions. Will be will be critical. Uh, obviously, an overlooked um, aspect of all the inbred mouse models that are around and, and used by everybody here to, to, to study these type of questions. Mm. Could I ask you just a mundane question, Stephanie? Give us a little more insight into retrobulbar AMFO. Can we use liposomal AMFO or ABLC? Does it have to be deoxycholate, which is really hard to get now uh, in this country? And uh, what are your endpoints? as you're doing it? That's, <clears throat> I have not um, done that myself, but I do know that I, it's, I think, primarily out of, I think, the Stanford ophthalmology group, or maybe UCLA, and I'm sorry if I'm misspeaking, um, that have kind of published these early case series. So um, I did see the, that it's liposomal AMFO that was used, but I don't know if it's. There, there is a big uh, Indian series from uh, the COVID epidemic claiming that uh, this is one of the adjunct therapies that use lipid AMFO, but as you know, it's all over the place. Different surgery, different time of surgery, different, but the so claim with this open label, you know, approach once every other day, lipid, and they have a protocol. It's somewhere in the literature as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, I was also one of the people to ask questions, but uh, in the back she says, two minutes now. But we're pretty good on time, so I'm going to take a couple of things. I just wanted to tell Carol that, um, I don't know, teaching microbiology today to medical students is basically sketchy microbe. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, sometime look it up. My daughter took it and she says, that's the only way to learn microbiology, because it's a visual type thing. They never see a plate. Uh, they never smell a plate. They're, sketchy microbe, taking over the world. Um, so again, I want to thank uh, the questions from, from the uh, audience here, the um, facilitators, and I really want to thank um, the young investigators, because I think you gave them a breadth of what they deal with. Um, and uh, since I'm coming right to the end, but I want to ask, I guess, one question of all five of you. There's a whole mess of questions I'd like to ask but, uh, for another day. Uh, and what I want to do from down at, um, at, uh, at uh, Shannon coming forward, so get ready. She's a dookie, so she gets the first, just like Floyd, because um, I know they can handle it. Uh, but the question I have is, what did COVID do to your career? What is your impression of what the last couple years has been for your training? And of course, you don't know because you haven't been through it before, but what's your impression? Um, <clears throat> honestly, COVID didn't have as dramatic an impact on my career as I think it probably had on uh, the clinicians in the room. Um, as a researcher, I was able to just sort of put my work on hold for a couple of months. Um, so it definitely set me back um, a few months, but it wasn't like years of work that I was pushed back on with COVID for me personally. So it impacted you because it slowed you up yes. in your career, but you were able to get right back to where you were at uh, and, and go. Pretty much, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Fariba? Well, um, I'm trying to compare the challenge of COVID with other challenges I had before that. 
uh, I finished medical school in Iran. And uh, we were supposed, we had to do a year or two of uh, service after completion of medical school. And that was when the war was going on. So comparing to that, COVID was a breeze, literally. See, it's, it's all relative, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Although COVID was a very extreme challenge for all of us, especially in infectious disease, but seeing what I have seen in the war area, <laughs> COVID was not too bad. Okay, Stephanie? Well, you put it into perspective, um, but I'll say, I think it impacted me, maybe sent me back about a year. I married to a pulmonologist who was staffing the COVID ICU, and you know we had kids that had to do homeschooling because our babysitters couldn't come in our house with a COVID physician. And <clears throat> so it, it was a setback, and I was just coming off of the end of a, a K grant, and so it was kind of dis disruptive, but that's perspective for you, you know? You pick it up and get right back in. I think the impact on our research program on the basic research site was fairly limited, I have to say. Of course, we had a lab shutdown for a couple of months, but this also provided uh, quality writing time and helped to get a, a lot of data analyzed to get papers out to, to work on, on grant drafts. So in the end, it's just things were done in a slightly different sequence, and um, but it didn't have a major direct impact, but I would like to have um, to highlight one like, small concern or maybe smoldering impact of, of COVID that, that could be out there, and that has to do with the funding system. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that many NIAID um, study sections specifically dedicated to, to fungal infections, and, and if you go with things like immunotherapies to the immunity and host defense study section, now you're confronted with potentially COVID vaccine trials or like, um, like high-level COVID research that puts maybe mucomycosis or um, other um, like more rare fungal infections um, lower in the priority. And, and this is something that's very difficult to evaluate and that's a, a concern that for the currently and, and maybe for the next couple of years, this um, might have a, a slight impact on, on our funding um, chances. And I definitely think we need more study section dedicated specifically to, to, to fungal work. And uh, that's a, a big limitation and a, a roadblock for our funding. Okay. Okay. And Andrea? So I think we, we've highlighted a lot of the negative aspects of the COVID uh, pandemic in my career. In mycology, it did um, put everything on hold, but I think one of the positive aspects that it had is that I had the opportunity to actually be exposed to clinical trials, and that's how I um, got, I guess, adapted that area into my area of interest. So I think that was one of the positive aspects of COVID in my career. Well, thank you all, and um, I'm about four minutes over, and I. I, I want to make one little quick comment, um, something I have to deal with a lot with young investigators, and you see up here a series of them. Um, I don't know if Donna's here and Emily's gone, but it's very frustrating for me to see some of these committed individuals coming through with passion, et cetera, et cetera. And as foreign medical grads and stuff like that, there's limitation in the kind of grants that you can apply for. And I suspect there's several of you up here that have mentioned that point. And to me, um, the most important ingredient is not where you came from, but the passion you have in the heart for the science. And it's just not right that uh, that, uh, that restriction is put up there. I think they need to rethink that. Um, and I just put up an ed editorial. Yes? Yeah, I would like to add a comment that I already forwarded to the um, to Donna Laff and the NIAID uh, program officer team yesterday. There, there's that major inconsistency. The um, foreign graduates are eligible for many uh, grants up to the postdoc level, and then eligible for all the research grant. But that those critical KO1, KO2, KO8, that's the the, the, the major roadblock um, yep. that we are facing. And and I hope in the in the future. Um, 
something could be done about, about these mechanisms. It's just not plausible to have everything below and everything above open to everybody, but those critical stepping stones oh. toward independence. We're going to make another couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, so Donna wants to get up and talk a little bit about this, and uh, I, I, I force the issue. Yeah. yeah, so hi everyone. For those that don't know, I'm Donna Love. I'm the program officer at NIAD that I cover um, basic mycology. Um, I'm just a foot soldier at NIAD, so I don't have authority to change rules. But I do want to encourage you all, you do have agency, and I think united you can make a difference. I know a few years ago, I think there was some issues with K's and the number of K's that NIAD was granting. and. I think folks got together and um, wrote letters and, and things changed. So, I mean, you know, talking to me, I can help you get through the process. I can't change the process. But I think together, united um, with maybe, you know, MSG or IDSA, I think, I think you do have agency there. So I would just encourage that. Um, and then also to the sort of next generation of... Um, medical mycologists, I'd encourage you to reach out to me. I know I do know some of you, but maybe not everyone. Um, and so really my job is to help folks get through the system. I can't change the system, but I can I have a lot of tips and tricks that can help you navigate that. So I just encourage you, I'm here the whole time, so please come and um, we can have some time to meet and chat. And then I'm also available always by phone call or Zoom. So, and also thanks for sharing your story. Thank you, Donna, and that's a perfect way to end this. Um, we have about uh, 35 minutes of a break. I guess there's posters over here. We'll start back here at 6 o'clock with the uh, business meeting. So thank everybody for doing this. Thank everybody for doing